I'm Carol Terry. I'm a professional historian. I've been teaching college level history for 28 years and I'm going to give you a few bites of history. I want to start today by asking a question. Why 1492? Why not 1490 or 1450? To answer that question we have to consider a lot of things. Everything that happens happens within existing circumstances and underlying causes. Why don't we talk about the Vikings as the discoverers of the Americas? We know that the Vikings did travel from Scandinavian countries across to Iceland, to Greenland, and from Greenland to North America. In the 9th century, early 10th century, they had the necessary boats and sails, and they were adventurers. But they didn't stay long, and historians differ as to why they didn't stay any longer or leave any accounts of having reached North America. It's also a possibility that the Chinese reached America before 1492. The Chinese had the capability of navigating across open oceans and with capable boats and sails. We know they reached the east coast of Africa by uh, the 1440s and there is some evidence that they may have sailed across to South America. There are some uh, bits of evidence that seemed to support that idea. But the Chinese didn't stay either if they did reach the Americas. They did not share their expertise of navigation with Europe. So in 1450, the only Europeans that had much interest in exploration were the Portuguese under Prince Henry of Portugal, which will We'll talk more about him in a different, uh, at a different point in time. But the European world included the Mediterranean Sea. There was no interest in the Atlantic on the western coast of Europe. But their lives centered around the Mediterranean Sea. Any ship voyages that were made by Europeans were across the Mediterranean which didn't require navigating with outside of land. So Europeans had no knowledge of navigation that would allow them to cross the ocean uh, to get away from the side of land. Italy in Europe was the center of trade. Europe was divided into city-states, which was a political entity, and the only part of Europe that really had any developed cities. So any trade that was uh, carried out across the Atlantic with the Muslim tradesmen was across the Mediterranean Sea. It would be the Renaissance that would bring about change in Europe that would allow Europeans the interest and the ability to be able to cross the Atlantic. This took, the Renaissance took place during the um, 14th and 15th centuries. Once again, historians differ on the exact time that the Renaissance started or stopped. The Renaissance started in Italy and it would spread to the rest of Europe. What brought about the Renaissance was the fact that the church, and when we talk about the church in the 14th and 15th centuries we're talking about the Catholic Church. All of Europe was Christian and all Christians were Catholic at this point in time. And when Europe was struck by the bubonic plague in the 1300s, the church was not able to provide answers or relief for those who were struck by this terrible disease which killed about two-thirds of Europeans. So people began looking outside of the church for answers. Up until this time, 
any education, any knowledge that was gained was gained through the Catholic Church, through monasteries or monks or priests. And the church did not encourage advancement in knowledge or education because they believed that the significance of life on earth was to prepare oneself for the afterlife. So advancements in knowledge or education um, only in the Bible, in the teachings of the church, was necessary. But during the Renaissance, like I said, when the church was not able to answer the needs, answer the questions, uh, people began seeking other ways to find answers. The Renaissance would see the increase of secular knowledge. It was during the Renaissance that we see the rise of universities. A lot of the teachings uh, that had come from ancient Greece and Rome had been lost to the Europeans. Uh, much of it had been carried away after the fall of Rome and then with the rise of the Ottoman Empire. A lot of those writings and teachings of the ancient Greeks and Romans, which is called classical knowledge, that was all lost to the Europeans, but because of the Crusades, which if you uh, have any knowledge of the Crusades, we're talking about the religious Crusades that were carried out in the 1200s. There were several phases of the Crusades, and those travels that the Crusaders made from Europe into uh, the Middle East they brought back some of those writings and some of the artifacts that had been lost. So with the availability of those writings of the ancient Greeks and Romans, uh, it, they managed to get into the hands of some of the Italians who were looking beyond the church for answers to these important questions. We see the rise of the universities, and early universities are going to be in Italy. There's an interest in um, astronomy, answers looking to the heavens, not to the church and not to a spiritual heaven, but uh, looking to the heavens for answers. So we have the rise of studies in astronomy, uh, specifically in Italy, people like uh, Copernicus, later on Galileo. But in studying the heavens, studying the, the movement of the planets and the stars, it is going to help to answer that question, why 1492? The change in uh, the intellectual climate of the day, if you will, in Italy, there's also change happening in Europe, political change. Europe was dominated by feudal domains. You have the pyramid structure of authority and loyalty beginning at the top with the lord of the castle and the lord that owned the castle and all of the surrounding land would also have uh, barons who would also be landowners that would be loyal to the lord and each of those barons and the Lord himself would have knights, which were uh, their military. And under the knights were the serfs, the people who lived on the land and actually did the work. They farmed the land, uh, they raised livestock, and they would provide food and services for the castle, for the Lord. So this was a feudal domain which was autonomous in itself. So they didn't need anything uh, in the way of trade with other countries, but each feudal domain was self-sufficient. Then you have numerous feudal domains throughout Europe. Eventually, as through the Renaissance, as things are changing, these uh, lords of the castles began seeking for more land 
And so they conquer other lords. And they set themselves up as kings with several feudal domains that are loyal to them, several lords, knights uh, that are loyal to the king. The king then, in establishing himself, needs riches, he needs uh, treasury. So they start seeking in other ways to bring wealth into their domain. So Europe uh, moving to uh, a political structure of kings, we're going to find that merchants in Italy will be providing trade goods to the kings. It's during this time period, during the Renaissance, that kingdoms are established, like uh, the Kingdom of France, Kingdom of Spain, the Kingdom of Portugal. And with these, building these kingdoms, you know, knights, treasury, all of these things are important for the kings to maintain control of their kingdoms. Italy, in the meantime, during the same time period, the political structure there are city-states, which you have the city, and it, large cities like Florence, Venice, Rome, of course. Uh, the city itself is the political authority in the countryside. So each city will have surrounding miles and miles of land that uh, is controlled by the city by the authority in the city, which would be the mayor, or in Italy they're called the dog. And Italy is, like I said earlier, a trade center. And they've been trading across the Mediterranean. Uh, there have been some Italian merchants who've crossed overland into China, while others uh, sail across the Mediterranean to the Middle East and even on to India, the East Indies and China for trade items. Again, which is very much influenced by the travels of the Crusaders, brought back exotic goods to Europeans, uh, especially into Italy, where you have a lot of wealthy merchants. And these wealthy merchants, as in any time period, wealthy always seeking to increase their wealth, and to exhibit their wealth in their lifestyle. So we have Italian merchants who are building these beautiful mansions, beautiful buildings in Florence, in Venice. In order to display their wealth, they want those exotic items from the East. Part of that interest is uh, in the spice trade. Spice trade had been going on a while a lot of the Italian merchants were using what has been called the Silk Road. That's the overland route uh, to China. And we have uh, such merchants as the Polo brothers. Uh, Marco Polo being a son and a nephew of the two Polo brothers um, who were very active in trade with the East, bringing back items that would be lumped together and called the spice trade. Which in, the spice trade included other spices which were only available in the East Indies, India, and China. One of the most sought after and one of the most expensive of these spices was pepper. Also cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, coriander, frankincense, myrrh, these were all part of the spice trade. But the spice trade wasn't just about spices. It included precious gems, such as jade, emerald, rubies, um, sapphires. So those would be included in what was called the spice trade, as well as silk. Silk, taffeta, velvet, and these were all important to those rich merchants in Italy because it helped to improve their lifestyle and make their, uh, reflect their status in society as the wealthy. Uh, what were those spices needed for? Why did they want the spices? 
Well, for one thing, pepper, which I said was one of the most sought after and most expensive, uh, was used to disguise the rancid taste of meat. Meat, of course, they had no way of preserving meat, so a lot of times when they ate the meat, it, it would already be spoiling, it would already be becoming rancid. But if they had the pepper and some of the other spices to put on the meat, uh, they could disguise that rancid flavor. And one of the indications of, very, of the very wealthy was how uh, great a table they could set for their guests. So they would have banquets, dinners, um, and they could serve these meats spiced up so that they taste flavorful. Uh, spices were also used for medicinal purposes and for fragrance. Remember, this is a time period when uh, people didn't bathe real often. They didn't wash their clothes real often. And if they had some of these spices, they could camouflage some of those bad odors. For instance, during the Black Plague, people who were afflicted with the sores, a really terrible stench, and people would carry around a cloth like a hanky with uh, the spices in it and when the odor got just unbearable they could put that up to their nose and and breathe in the smell of the spices rather than all the terrible odors not only of the sores that the plague brought but also uh, burned the bodies of the people who died and that of course made a terrible odor in the, in the area uh, so spices were very important and it was only the wealthy that could obtain these spices. And it was the Italian merchants who were uh, making the trip, whether it was overland across Europe and Asia or whether it was across the Mediterranean and through the Middle East to the Far East. Economic changes came about during the Renaissance. Uh, because of the, of the rise of interest in the spices and everything the spice trade could bring. But it was very expensive and it took a long time to go overland. It was dangerous. It was dangerous to go through the Middle East to the Far East. Um, you could always be overset by uh, robbers or chieftains that control certain areas that so people began searching for other ways to get to the East in order to get involved in the spice trade, merchants looking for new routes. But the only um, idea was to sail West to get to the East. And at this point in time, uh, people in Europe had no good idea of how far it would be from the west coast of Europe to China. And they had no knowledge that there was any, any continent in between Europe and China to the west. Um, and they, their estimation of the distance between the west coast of Europe and China was way short of the actual existence. So they had this idea that they can sail west to reach China rather than going overland or going through the Middle East. But for that to be possible, they need means of navigating with outside of land. And in um, 1450, they had no knowledge. They had no way of doing that. Now, Prince Henry of Portugal had been interested in exploration to Africa for many years uh, by the 1440s. And he was sending ships exploring along the west coast of Africa. Uh, but they when they sailed, they stayed within sight of land. At one point in the 14, around the 1440s, 
uh, Prince Henry sent messages out inviting scholars of the world to come to Portugal to study together. And there were scholars who came from China, from the Middle East, to Portugal to study together on uh, navigation, theories of navigation, and astronomers, map makers, um, people interested in navigation, all came together to share their knowledge. I said earlier that uh, there was evidence the Chinese may have reached South America due to the efforts of a Chinese captain called Zhang He. He had made at least seven voyages across the Indian Ocean um, and around to Madagascar and the west, the east coast of Africa. So he obviously had navigational instruments and uh, the ability to sail with outside of land. But when, after Zheng He's seventh voyage, there was a new emperor that ascended to the throne. This was during the Ming Dynasty. And this new emperor's advisors had told him that he needed to stop those voyages because Zheng He was bringing back items from all these different countries that he visited. And these advisors to the emperor in China said they were corrupting the Chinese culture by bringing in all these exotic goods. So the emperor, in taking their advice, destroyed all of Zheng He's ships, uh, all of the information, the instruments, to stop all of the voyages. But fortunately for us, I think, the, some of those men who sailed with Zheng He had kept information. And so when Prince Henry called for scholars to meet in Portugal, some of those scholars from China brought that information, which would help to lead to the ability for Europeans to cross the Atlantic Ocean. This is going on in Portugal. Uh, because of the Renaissance, there are economic changes, political changes in Europe. Uh, some of the economic changes that are occurring, this is the time period when banks are first instituted and that, of course, is in Italy. Banking system, like using uh, debit and credit bookkeeping, that's when this uh, first came about. A uh, system that is still in use today. So with the advancements in creating kingdoms and changes in the economy because of the activity of the merchants, uh, there are more people that are going to become interested in getting involved in the spice trade. Three men, three Italian merchants, start making plans to try to cross the Atlantic. They know about the information that's coming from Portugal about advancements in navigation. Advancements such as the creation of uh, navigational instruments, uh, the astrolabe, uh, the sextant, uh, the compass. Also, because of the studies in astronomy, they, in studying the stars, they realize that there are certain stars that are so permanent in their position that they could determine their location on Earth in relationship to the stars. So men in Portugal are creating star charts that will allow people to be able to navigate with outside of land, simply by measuring their distance in relationship to the stars. So we have the star charts. We have map makers who are compiling all the information that has come from uh, men who have traveled overland to China and who have brought information back about the east coast of China, uh, geographical information, latitude and longitude, so all this information is coming into Portugal and they are using it to create maps. Maps, star charts, but even with that, it's not possible to sail across 
the ocean because 1450 ships are not uh, waterproof enough that they can't stay out on the water very long for them to pull into port to uh, refurbish the ship to make it uh, be able to go back out on the water without taking in water. So it's also in Portugal when they start experimenting with different ways of building ships. And they come up with the way of overlapping the boards on a ship um, and also using pitch and tar to make the ship more waterproof so it can stay out on the on the ocean longer, out on the water longer. But also they need better sails. The sails they've been using depended on the wind in order to go in the direction they wanted to go. But they started making better sails, the, called lant lanteen sails, which would allow them to turn the sails and whichever the way the wind was coming from, they could turn their sails in such a way that they could go in the direction they wanted to go, sim rather than simply having to go the way the wind's blowing. So better ships, better sails, um, navigational instruments, these are, all, these are things that are all coming together in the late 1400s. So three merchants, Italian merchants, start making plans. Now they, they know each other, but they're not working together. They're, each one is working separately from the others. Um, they had been wool merchants before, but they want to get involved in the spice trade because that's what's really lucrative. That's where they're going to really to bring in, really be able to bring in wealth. These three men are Christopher Columbus, Giovanni Cabotti, which will later be called John Cabot, and Amerigo Vespucci. So they're all working to put plans together to sail westward to get to China. Even though they have uh, good ships, sails, navigational instruments, they need financing. They need money. So they're looking for backers. They're looking uh, for somebody to uh, sponsor or invest in their expeditions. Uh, Christopher Columbus evidently um, was a little further ahead than the other two in his plans and started seeking for financial backing. He tried the wealthy merchants uh, in Italy, the banks. Nobody wanted to back his venture because it's something that hadn't been done before and it's a risky investment. Um, he goes to Queen Isabel and of Spain. Um, Isabel turns him down. He goes to England. He, he uh, taps every possible avenue to get funding. And 1490, he has no funding. He hasn't been able to get any funding. Looking for a few minutes to Queen Isabel, two kingdoms were joined together by marriage to create Spain. King Ferdinand of Aragon married uh, Queen Isabel of Castile to create the nation of Spain. But all of their efforts, all of their attention was in driving the Muslims out of the Iberian Peninsula, which Spain and Portugal are the two countries on the Iberian Peninsula. Back in around 600-700 AD, Muslims had invaded the Iberian Peninsula and conquered the country. So the Muslims had been there for several centuries and they did not try to destroy Christianity uh, they were persecuting the Christians, but Isabel and Ferdinand wanted to reconquer Spain for Christianity. So they put all of their money, all of their men, their knights, their soldiers, 
uh, to work driving out the Moors. So for years, they had been carrying on this Reconquista. 1492, they destroyed the last Muslim stronghold. So the war's over. Spain now has a country full of unemployed soldiers. Um, and they need to refurbish their treasury. So Columbus in 1492 goes back to Queen Isabella, asked for financing for his expedition, promising Isabella that he would uh, take Christianity to the heathens in India, East India, East Indies, and bring back uh, treasures for Spain. So 1492, all of these things came together to make it possible for Christopher Columbus to cross the Atlantic. Not to India as he had planned, but we know what happened. Our next um, bite of history, we'll talk a little bit more about the crossing of the Atlantic. Come back and join us then. Please check the description box below the video for references and for more information if you have an interest in this topic.